which is actually, I think, a record for an alumni weekend event. We're only half an hour late. This is a historic record. I think it's actually going to be the first of many, many things about this weekend that are better than other weekends because, for the first time, the Alumni Association is fully responsible for everything that's going to happen. So the Alumni Association is Diana Ross and the school has become the supreme. So we just sort of rock, rocking backwards and forwards in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the background. And actually, if you know anything about the Supremes, they, they changed all the time. They're, and so we are the same. We're just kind of uh, the support, support team. Uh, I'm super grateful for the Alumni Association doing that. As I was saying last night, I don't think it's such a coincidence that there's this transformation of the alumni spirit and interconnectivity at the same time as the school is trying to re-engineer the way it uh, thinks. Um, uh, in a certain sense, we're in, the, we're in the ideas business, if you think it's a business, um, but we, ideas is our main, main uh, concern, and I think we are quite expert at incubating ideas, and there's an enormous depth of wisdom in, in the teachers about how to do that, and uh, despite all of those uh, qualities, the world now asks, asks of us a higher degree of flexibility and interconnectivity, and, and what it means to, to think today is not the same as it was uh, five years ago. So the school has gone through an enormous evolution in order to honor its responsibility to thought, to how, how one would think, uh, how, how does one think, um, knowing that by 2050, um, 7 billion of the 9.3 billion people living on Earth will live in cities, and I've yet to meet a single person who has any, any, any idea what that means. Uh, and that includes especially people who do large books. By the way, you, when you're writing about megacities, you try to show how good you are by how big your book is, as if this book size has to match your subject. But as with people like me who talk too much, you may end up thinking that there's actually nothing behind it. And I think the people who do the enormous books on megacities are disguising the fact they have no idea what's about to happen. And as I was saying last night, I think we've got about five or six years to gear up for the intellectual challenge and professional challenge that comes with this uh, demographic tsunami in which, of course, China is early warning system uh, for India, which will be the world's largest economy in 2050, and, and, and India is the early warning system for Africa. Africa is surely the future. Uh, we're not even ready for the, for, for the next step in this uh, uh, evolution. So what, as the school kind of um, d develops a new capacity for thought uh, with this kind of tsunami in, in mind, um, the, the alumni have, have, for their own reasons, also kind of gathered together and have become a, um, a really sort of strong group. And today's event is full of really wonderful speakers and it is a very high level event. It's a straight out academic conference. Uh, if you remember rightly, when, when we started with the idea of having, amazing, for this school, of course, having an alumni association is an extraordinarily controversial act in an American university. So it's just one of the signs of this school being different from other schools, that the idea that, I, I remember as Rick Scafidio said to me when I invited him to the very first alumni event, he said, I'm not an alumni of the school, I just went to the school. So nobody ever goes to this school in order to say that they did go to the school. And our sister schools are places that you go to because you want to say afterwards that you went there. Actually, uh, for most of the people who go to this school, there was no other option. They could only think, they could only live, they could only change. Like people coming to New York, they just, there, is no, there was no decision, no option. And you don't come to New York in order to say that you once lived there. You don't come to this school and say, oh, I'm, I'm from uh, GSAP. Nevertheless, most of the people who do come here or in that way, their lives change. And when they meet each other, it's, it's a very emotional thing to, ex to, to exchange ideas about how lives uh, changed. So this changing of lives and ideas matches very well. Um, this, this New York immigrant experience uh, is, of course, uh, being globalized uh, uh, in, in this moment, uh, where uh, some of the things that we're very familiar with in New York City have become now uh, uh, the, the condition of everyday life for, for, for the citizens of the planet. But much of what goes on in New York has absolutely no relevance at all to what's going on in the world. And maybe New York, for example, um, is just a sort of uh, elegant uh, model of cosmopolitan, dense cosmopolitan life, but it's certainly not a model for how one will live in 2050. And maybe Mumbai right now occupies New York's position in the world as a kind of model of, of, um, uh, of, of, of a rapidly evolving immigrant uh, uh, society and so on. So having said all of this, it just makes perfect sense to me that when you organize an event to get together, it's the, the academic quality is at, at, at a high and, and that you're raising very, very urgent 
and important questions. So just to quickly uh, run down for you what's new in the school, 439 students from nine programs will graduate in two weeks. The school started in 1881 with two students. Um, they both passed. It was in the School of Mines and Sanitary Engineering and in what will always go down as the single greatest st strategic era of the School of Architecture, we disconnected from sanitary engineering. Um, because as you, uh, as you know, everybody knows that uh, the plumber should be paid and plumbing is not an idea, um, it's, it's a fact. And everybody knows that architects have some difficulty persuading people to be paid because architecture is an idea, not, not a fact. I mean, it's an idea about facts. It's even an idea about plumbing. So I think if we'd kept the sanitary engineering uh, sideline, we would be um, um, rich with ideas. Um, anyway, so 439 students are now graduating from nine programs. The first class of the critical curatorial and conceptual practice program um, directed by uh, Professor Felicity Scott, who's just a, a wonderful teacher and uh, thinker. This has really changed the school a lot. So there's been a big change even in the last two years with a new generation who are, like our guest speaker today, are going to do their work through, through writing or through exhibitions for publications, curatorial work and so on. They have infected the school with new kinds of optimism and as you know this is a pretty optimistic, this is like the last stronghold of optimism um, and that's why the walls are so strong. Um, I know the building tells the world that the future is you know ancient Greece um, but this has been a very good cover for us to really uh, uh, feel optimistic about the, the, the big questions that are being asked of us. Um, the Center for Urban Real Estate opened uh, uh, this year, which is for the, not only, I guess last time I was telling, I feel like I'm making a kind of annual report. Um, if I was telling you last time how the mortal enemies of architecture and development, and even beyond that, preservation and development, are now in some sort of illicit friendship that may or may not last, but it's very intense, it's very hot and heavy. Um, this way in which the development program has become an integral part of the, of the life of the school this takes, in a way, its, its necessary next step that, that, the, that the development program becomes a research base. And so the arrival of the research center directed by Vishan Chakrabarti is, I think, extremely important. And of course, you really can't fit into the school if you don't have hardcore uh, uh, research. We are a professional school, but only a professional school inside a research school. This is the only school in the world which is literally inside a library. You are right now as, as you're closer to more books right now than you will ever be, even if you were to walk into the New York Public Library, actually, because they're all around you, right, right where you are now. So we are inside the knowledge or inside the, the, the reflection. The global network, like I was telling you last night, gets bigger and bigger. We may now perhaps have more space outside the school than inside the school. And these uh, um, spaces in, in New York itself and in Rio and Mumbai and Beijing and Amman and so on and, and, just, and in the next few months, Moscow, Johannesburg and Istanbul, these spaces are starting to generate um, new ways of thinking. And, and as the knowledge from those spaces starts to come back to the school and interact with the school and vice versa, the real, the real game uh, will, will begin. We really don't know where that, what's going to happen there. This is why it's called pseudo X. X means we have no idea. Uh, but at least we admit that, um, which gives us a shot, I think. Uh, soon we're going to create here, we are creating starting construction in, in the summer, the Center for Global Design and Development, which is going to be basically a hub to allow Columbia University to gather all of its various forms of expertise around the question of the city. Because if in 1881 we were asked to reduce stupidity about cities because America was going through rapid urbanization, we figured out very soon you couldn't do that just with architecture. It would be architecture, urban design, planning, real estate, historic preservation, and so on. Uh, no school of architecture can claim any uh, specialized uh, ownership of thought about cities. There is unlikely to be any thinking in the university in the future will, which will not be thinking about cities, because cities will be, the, the question of the city is simultaneously the question of psychology, of the brain, of history, of memory, of finance, of design, e everything, public health, social work, journalism. So there will be no difference between the question, what is a university and what is a think tank devoted uh, to cities. So we have, as it were, outsourced um, uh, our responsibility. And I think that's actually pretty um, exciting. 
So we, we're making a space to allow that kind of collaborative work uh, uh, to operate. Uh, what hasn't changed? Uh, Ken Frampton and Richard Plants are still teaching at the school. Um, just so you know. Uh, and it was lovely to see Ken signing his books outside. Uh, Richard's program, by the way, has never been stronger. There are like 52 students in urban design. You can imagine that urban design is, is uh, getting militarized even as we speak because the battle is very, very urgent uh, for them. And that intermediate scale between the scale of a building for architecture and the scale of uh, uh, cities for planning, that urban design scale seems to be kind of acupuncture point in the, for, for young, young uh, professionals. Um, uh, probably students are traveling two or three times as much as they used to. Every student, typically now more than once, it's, uh, um, you know, it, there'll be some point at which you will hear about an airline that has been absorbed by this school, um, and we will, you know, carry the burden of that. Um, the, the whole alumni thing, I mean, I, I almost want to discourage you from being alumni. Um, I just, I don't want this to turn into a sort of secret handshake, um, Columbia insignia tattooed on the right or the left, I can't remember which one, buttock. Um, I don't want you to be wearing funny pajamas once a year. Um, it, we have to preserve the idea that, that, the people that the people who were at the school are actually were never and will never be alumni in the straightforward sense of celebrating having been in a place, but are, are still inside the school because pro probably the line between the inside and the outside of the school is one of the first things that disappears as we change our way of thinking. So you are part of, as it were, the extended brain of the school. So I, I do think the word alumni can, can kind of distract us from the fact that it's the, 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 the sort of social intelligence that you are forming that's so important. All of this is, is just would be a really uh, long and, and is, in fact, a really long and clumsy way of, of introducing Michael. Um, but I think it, it should be sort of obvious why such a person and, and why I'm so impressed with your choice of, of, of Michael for your speaker. My, you know, Michael's a writer, of course, um, a, a writer and a critic. It's funny that people would say writer and critic, like what would be the, what, what happens when you cross over from writer to critic, I don't know. He is, of course, the chief ar architecture critic uh, of the New York Times. And as you can, if you read between the lines of today's newspaper, you can understand that he's wasted significant amount of his youth in um, uh, baseball fields, but I'm learning more and more that he's also in football fields, by which I mean real football fields, not that um, uh, silly uh, game where people wear, wear helmets, um, and those helmets do the damage to the opponent that the helmet is meant to stop, in a, in a kind of analogy of the gun lobby argument that you have a gun in order to stop yourself from being shot by somebody else, but you end up shooting more people as a result. So you have this sort of magnificently stupid game, uh, but it sounds like his lo I hope his loyalties are, uh, remain with Arsenal. And it's, uh, he sounds already, and he shares with us with Reinhold, who's going to be speaking later, a kind of fatal addiction um, to the real thing, which is, which is football. Anyway, pr prior to being uh, uh, a writer in architecture, of course, M Michael has had many, many lives, including playing a similar role uh, uh, as the art critic um, for the New York Times. And I, and I remember when, when, when he was assigned to be the architecture critic, the reception in the, ar in the architectural field was, oh, we're no longer worthy of our own. <laughs> we no longer get our own one. Uh, but I think s some of us read it the other way around, of course, that architecture was, was assuming it had the same status within the newspaper as art. And in fact, uh, expertise was understood to overlap. And of course, Michael had a not so secret r uh, life as somebody who writes books about architects and was in fact uh, eminently uh, knowledgeable about that. So actually, for those of you who may have been surprised by the particular way that he has uh, rethought what it means to be an architecture critic in the New York Times. I think if you look at the extended history, particularly the gap between being an architecture critic and an art critic, or the other way around, the time in Berlin, I think, where he's operating much more in, uh, in the mode of the writer, uh, uh, the writer about cities and about society, uh, more of a cultural critic, perhaps. The idea that, in a way, architectural criticism is now understood as a, as a kind of a part of cultural criticism seems to me more uh, um, appropriate, and quite the opposite of that tragic moment when architecture became part of the arts and leisure section. I had this horrible thought that we were on the leisure side uh, of, of the uh, economy. Anyway, uh, 
it, it, it somehow, I said it once before in this very room, but I think the fact that you're a pianist is not an irrelevant uh, 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 fact here. And that there is, of course, a lot of research on this, that people who listen to music and who play music um, are smarter. So in, if the School of Architecture is a stupidity reduction machine, uh, it, it's, it welcomes always really smart people. And you have one uh, here right today, uh, Michael. Thank you for that really lovely introduction. <clears throat> um, and, and I'm really um, honored and, and happy to be here. Um, I, I'm not sure that all musicians are smarter, but, the, but I like the idea. I just don't think it's exactly true. And by the way, about plumbing, I don't know how many of you know this, but at a certain point I was, was doing um, a book that involved the early history of the Metropolitan Museum. But you know, when the Met was founded, it, had, um, it, had, it taught plumbing. That the, the Met, in its early stages, did not conceive itself, of course, to be a museum that could become a great collector of, um, of uh, original objects. And so it, it built this plaster collection, of course, of reproductions. And it also was very practical-minded. It, it thought it was training people to go out and become artists and become, uh, I suppose, architects or, in any case, uh, um, competent people. So it, it did teach plumbing classes. Possibly the Met's turning point was also when it quit... <laughs> Doing plumbing. So how, uh, how can I turn this on? Slides? Um, is this me? I'm supposed to know how to do this? OK, hold on. Hold on. This is, this is really a big mistake. Hold on. I forgot to mention this is being live streamed across the planet. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's awake at this hour. Um, OK, somebody has to help me here because I can't. What do you think? Mm, no. Well, it was here. I can talk without slides, but, but who wants to look at me for the next 40 minutes? So, um, Are you up there? Can you come, please, help me? Thanks. And uh, um, while I'm ad-libbing, uh, I, will, I will say that... Um, one of the nicest things that anybody said to me lately was, uh, um, why the hell are your pieces running in that art section? <laughs> Parking in the art section, that's so, I, I love this. I, I feel like I'm a bit of a, a fish out of water now in that section. And I think, um, how are we doing? No, that's not too good. That's it. Thanks. Perfect. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I, I do think that's uh, it's crucial to to restore the idea that uh, that architecture is not um, the uh, the leisure business. Um, so, uh, uh, picking up on your point that uh, that younger people are looking at urban design as this uh, acupuncture point, as you said. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that this morning. Um, uh, public health uh, depends on the freedom of public discourse. A society that cannot talk to itself is a society in crisis. Public space provides a context for this freedom of public discourse. So what do we mean by public space? Uh, the public realm is what we own and control, is how Alex Garvin, whom you all know, I'm sure, uh, answered that question when I asked him. More than just common property, he said, public space means the streets, squares, parks, infrastructure, and public buildings that make up the fundamental element in any community, the framework around which everything else grows, or should grow. Uh, those of you who recall um, New York on 9-11 uh, and during the days after will remember that uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, people uh, went outside to gather in parks like Prospect Park and, and Union Square. They didn't just retreat online. They sought out public spaces to be with each other. Our human instinct is to come together. People occupy those parks and squares, hanging ribbons and photographs on fences, concocting makeshift memorials, gathering in clusters to talk, and in a sense, reveal themselves to themselves. That is, prove to themselves and each other that they belonged to a larger community, a greater city, that there was strength in numbers and to show solidarity in a way that online chatter dispensed 
you know, from the privacy and isolation of, of one's own room, never can. What questions of public good arise in the arenas of architecture and urbanism? What, what happens, for instance, when privatization and the marketplace conflict or join together uh, with public interests? How does a focus on the public good intersect with the preservation of democratic political spaces and institutions? So I've already put forth the premise that the public good is served when public space is served. Um, I got into journalism uh, years ago out of a desire to participate in, in a kind of public conversation. I, I was here before talking with Gwen Wright and um, Ken Frampton was reminding me that I, I suddenly had this strange moment of Freudian self-analysis, which I will um, re repeat, which is that I grew up in this, um, here in the city, I grew up in the village, uh, in a household where my father, uh, who was a surgeon and uh, read all sorts of left-wing political magazines, um, religiously uh, circled and clipped out articles from the New York Times because he was convinced that the paper was a mouthpiece for the CIA. Um, <laughs> And among other things, this actually led me to believe that journalism really mattered. Um, that, uh, or that, 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 anyway, that serious journalism was a medium of, of uh, public consciousness and uh, public discourse. And then when I became a student uh, at Yale and, and then a uh, graduate student at Harvard, and, and with this crucial, very lucky year in between, when I was an editor of ID Magazine, I fell into that job, um, focusing on architecture and design, I, I retained this very ill-formed but um, tangible uh, idea of trying to join this public debate. Um, and uh, I, I did history and then gravitated towards art history at Harvard because as it was then being taught, it promised a link between culture and the larger social and historical forces um, in the world. And then afterwards, I fell kind of almost by chance into my job as the former job as the Times' as chief art critic. But I was always struggling in that job to find um, both a literary voice, I think there is a difference between being a writer and a critic, um, and also to make art meaningful to a wide swath of readers. And over the years, I actually became quite frustrated, I have to admit, by the increasingly narrow purview of the art world. So several years ago, um, I did move to Berlin, and I invented this column called Abroad that was my uh, attempt to sort of use culture as a window through which to examine social and political forces shaping Europe and the Middle East, to really kind of reframe cultural journalism for myself as an exploration of, of how we live. The move to architecture was therefore, for me, a, a very natural one because I had always taken for granted that architecture included urbanism and uh, questions of infrastructure, housing, planning, issues of social equity, you know, how, how we live. Um, I mean, as an art critic, I, I naturally grasped um, the, the, the central significance, I guess you'd say, of, of formal and material inventions, which had seemed to me to have um, redefined architecture uh, in the popular imagination. I mean, I get, I get the formal appreciation of, of buildings. But to the extent that the field um, in recent years had allowed itself to become a subset of the art world, the leisure industry, you might say, with its focus on buildings and uh, as, as, uh, as attractions, as baubles, um, I, I thought architecture actually had sol sold itself short. So I look back um, on Ada Louise, Huxtable, um, because I thought she treated the position as a public policy column. Um, you know, the architect's responsibility, the architecture critic's responsibility, I should say, um, the job's great opportunity, it seemed to me, was to give to the paper's architectural discussion a, a broad purview and social urgency and to focus, as architects and urban planners do, on issues of public health, public space, public-private interests, and to explore the city, cities generally, in fine-grained ways, you know, to use a reporter's um, skills to to talk to people, to ask how they uh, what they think works architecturally, what doesn't, and in the end, also to play an advocate's role, and not simply to respond to the latest project or proposal, but to stimulate conversation when possible, and maybe even nudge it towards what I saw as a more humane um, civil society. Um, so, uh, for example, it, it struck me coming back from several years in Europe that it was remarkable how New Yorkers and Americans generally took for granted that uh, the notion that uh, Madison Square Garden, um, a single, a privately owned building, 
and the desires of its, its owners should take precedence over the welfare of millions of, of uh, I mean millions of us who suffer Penn Station trapped below it. Um, you know, in, in Western Europe, I, I don't want to idealize uh, Europe too much, but I mean, as you are aware, there is a kind of social compact that prevails whereby it's presumed that the state um, provides decent housing, health care, schooling, clean streets, excellent transportation, um, in return for higher taxes. The stress there is on the greater public good. It was very interesting, by the way, to, to talk to European friends about the health care debate because it was inconceivable. It was, it was simply hard for Europeans to even engage in what seemed to them a rational conversation about how we might be debating whether or not uh, people should have health care here or health insurance in any case. Um, but as I said, the stress there is on the greater public good and, and whether or not you know, the European system uh, is affordable ultimately and for all the problems of the Euro. The notion on collective good, I think, is the difference um, from our American you know, uh, rugged individualism and, and free market capitalist idea. Um, uh, Ada Louise, back in the 60s, I'll remind you, um, uh, noted that at the turn of the last century, the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, Alexander Cassatt, had wanted to build a hotel atop Penn Station to capitalize on air rights, same idea. But McKim uh, talked him out of it. Um, the railroad owed the city uh, a thoroughly and distinctly monumental gateway. Well, those were McKim's words. Um, so back then, briefly, you had this idealism triumphing over commerce. And the railroad, a private interest, even went so far as to see the wisdom and responsibility of acting for the greater public good. The lesson to be gleaned, I think, from the destruction of, of the old Penn Station entails preserving and encouraging McKim's public-spirited ideal for urban splendor, as much as it may have to do with uh, preserving venerable buildings, because I think there's a difference. Um, I was just going to tell you a little bit about my trip. Um, uh, a week or two ago to Colombia. Um, for you, many, uh, many of you this may be familiar, but I just want to make a few general observations talking about um, issues of public good and architecture and so forth. Um, so you're looking here, of course, at the, um, the cable car system in uh, Medellin, um, which famously has uh, uh, reconnected the slums um, that rise on the hills of the valley and Medellin to the central part of the city down below. Um, the metro system there is absolutely fantastic. I mean, the, the subways look like operating theaters. It's absolutely incredible. In fact, while I was there during rush hour, there was a woman with a mop cleaning in the cars. Um, there's this incredible sense of, of public pride. And the, um, the funder of the metro is partly the um, um, supplier of um, electricity, the public service provider uh, there, which guarantees in Medellin that even in the slums, even in illegal housing, <clears throat> in informal settlements, if there is a house, it must be supplied with clean water. The water level, uh, clean water issues are very good in Medellin, um, and electricity. So the slums in Medellin um, are, in fact, on the whole, in much better shape than the ones uh, in Bogota. And the transportation system includes this funicular, which is um, helpful, though you can imagine that still if you live way up in the mountains, it's not exactly the easiest way to get into town. It cuts down. Uh, I met a, a few people who worked, young people who worked up in the, in the slums um, high up in the hills, and they, they used to take about an hour and a half to get to a job. Now it's about 45 minutes, so that's a big improvement. Um, and as you know, part of the urban renewal project under Fajardo there um, involved the promotion of um, new architecture, particularly by local architects. This is um, the Orchidiorama, um, which is by Plan B, a young architectural firm there. It's very beautiful. This is, the key thing to say about this is that the botanical garden in which this, is, uh, this pavilion exists uh, had been one of the most dangerous places in the city. Um, I mean, you, I will just remind you that at the height of, of uh, the troubles in Medellin in the early 90s, the murder rate there was about 381 to 100,000. So to put that in perspective, um, that would be about 30,000 murders a year in New York City. Um, just completely off the charts. Uh, 
I mean, uh, Juarez is about 130 to 130,000, I think, at the moment, um, and Caracas about 120. So it was a very, very dangerous place, and, and the, as, as everyone has said, the renewal has had to do with this. But, um, and, uh, but I'm, this is going to change from what you already know in a moment. I just want to show you a couple of things that were striking. In ways, the most beautiful building I saw and the most interesting was in Medellin was this one by um, Salmona. It was the, maybe the last building that Salmona did, and it made me think that he's a genius. Um, it's a community center, a cultural center, it's called in Moravia, which is an area next to a, a large landfill. Um, and uh, it's this very beautiful, you know, typical uh, Salmona brickwork um, and beautiful open spaces and plazas within the, the, the whole interior exterior thing is just gorgeous, um, as you also see. And it's right on the um, edge of this center. It becomes really this, the, this uh, landfill. It really becomes a, uh, a, a central gathering place for kids and other people uh, in the neighborhood. Um, just a magnificent example of a, how a single building can help transform a neighborhood. However, the plan uh, to redeem the landfill area involves moving everybody who lives there, who's been living there for a couple of generations, far out to the edge of the city to a new settlement. Now, the landfill is a dangerous place, this is true. But this is, and now I switch, this is one of the problems of what I noticed down there. It's a very top-down approach. The idea of community bottom-up discussion of urban development is really foreign in Colombia. So a lot of what we've been hearing about really has to do with this um, uh, attempt by, the, by these very progressive and interesting leaders, Fajardo and in Bogota, um, Mocos and then Penelosa, to uh, transform the cities um, through architecture and, and infrastructural changes, but not so much about community development. Um, and when you look at some of the, when I looked at some of the, the buildings that had gone in that have gotten a lot of attention, this, the black cubes that you, or shapes that you see in the back are the uh, buildings by Mazzanti, Giancarlo Mazzanti, the, uh, I'm sure you all know as well. This is the Espana Library. Um, they are, they situate on top of that uh, sort of mountainside or in, in the brow of the mountain as it were, um, where the funicular take, makes its first stop. So what you're seeing are in fact some of the public plazas, is this it? Yeah. The public plazas that have been created in walkways and then this, the funicular is basically where you are. Um, but I have to tell you that those buildings which became iconic and, and therefore do serve a purpose in terms of creating a kind of, um, in, in creating both a landmark and a sense of pride in the community, they're lousy buildings, they're really terrible. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but they just don't work. They, they're these boxes within these containers the sound levels are terrible. People can't really work in there. It's very depressing. You don't really see out of the buildings very well. Um, he did a much better library, uh, at Sante, this one, called La Ladera, which is also in, um, in um, Bogota, but it's gotten less attention because it's less, I think, iconic looking. It sits, uh, in, a, it's, it sits in a less, uh, in, a, in a mixed neighborhood um, and has these very, um, it's very light filled and very open. The, the top of these different pavilions, all are public spaces connected as you see here uh, on this side with what it was an existing um, a, a ball field basically and um, then a, a few uh, football fields and so forth. Um, and uh, this, the, the integration of the system is kind of the same where you have these boxes connected by a circulation that goes around it. That's very much the same as the other, but it, here the, the space is inside work, they, they faced uh, the hill, um, and the circulation within them makes much more sense, it's, it's quite nice. Um, he also did this in Bogota, um, which is a lot of architecture for a very <laughs> small thing, but I just wanted to mention it as well. Um, this is actually just simply a canopy over a, another um, ball court, uh, football, um, soccer um, plaza. It's not really a whole field. Um, in an area called Kazukao. Uh, now in Bogota, we're dealing with a, a different sort of situation. Um, so Kazuka is uh, mostly made up of, of basically refugees from the countryside, fleeing both the paramilitaries and the guerrillas. Um, uh, spectacularly poor and um, 
and a crime-ridden area. Uh, and you do not have the same kind of infrastructural support. Um, I went to this school. Let me see if I can point it out here. So this is a, this is a kind of container extension of a school made of containers that uh, is the local public school. And this was the area of, this was the center of, the, of this town, this settlement, this um, informal settlement on this hill. Um, and inside the school I went and saw these kids. Um, I, I asked, um, having been to a few community centers in the, these areas, well, uh, what is the, what is the uh, issue about feeding these kids. Do they get uh, meals? Because in some other places there had been free breakfasts and lunches. They said, no, the program for that had run out. Um, I said, is that an issue here? And they said, well, about a quarter of the children uh, are malnourished. By, they test this every year. So I mention this because um, it's great that, that they have this sort of iconic, albeit kind of over-the-top uh, thing that Mazzante has designed. And there is a certain sense of putting literally putting Kazuka in people's minds by virtue of this um, sort of canopy structure, uh, like a tree, well, a canopy of trees that you can see from below. But um, it's a very, uh, you know, it's just a reminder of how uh, the, the limitations of what a single structure like that can do. Um, this is one of the nicer streets in Kazuka. Uh, open sewage, uh, electricity stolen, so forth. Azanti also did something else that's quite interesting, I just wanted to remind you of in Bogota, which is um, in the uh, slum called Bose, on the sort of edge. This is a school, actually quite nice, uh, with this, um, this is kind of an oval shape. I'm sorry I didn't bring the, something that shows you better, but, uh, and out, outside there's a lot of really bad new housing that, again, top-down housing of the sort of worst sort we imagine of Tower in the Park stuff. Um, and this is kind of planted there like some UFO that's landed, but it's really beautiful inside uh, and, and just heartbreaking. You know, we have 400 applicants uh, for, one, for one spot in the school. Um, I just showed that to you because it's oh, sweet. Um, so there, so uh, I'm trying to suggest to you that there are, there are really some wonderful things there, um, but also some serious and larger problems which have not been confronted. And the biggest thing I wanted to mention to you, to talk about public um, good and public space, is the transmillennio, the, the sort of sim the great achievement of Bogota, um, which is the rapid bus system. And here's what's really interesting, of course, about um, all of these kinds of uh, issues uh, of, of urban transformation through things like uh, uh, new transit or, or whatever, that if there's no maintenance to it, if it's not, if it doesn't continue, to expand um, what was at one time a uh, uh, triumph becomes a catastrophe. So the transmillennio now, which of course still, you know, people like Penulosa have understandably wanted to go around and celebrate, is considered the single most uh, loathed, uh, disastrous thing in Bogota. Um, and this is what it looks like at rush hour. I mean, it's, uh, it's overcrowded, you had one point uh, two million riders, I think it was, six years ago. Now you have 1.8 million riders in a system that has not grown at all. In fact, uh, it's deteriorated a great deal. So there's enormous crime. Um, the women are molested. Uh, it's a rapid bus system is very good, obviously, as a supplement to a metro system. But for a city the size of Bogota, the size of New York, essentially, you cannot, it just, you just cannot have buses supply everybody um, with r rapid transit. And they're the crucial link for those um, informal settlements to the south, like Bose and Kazuka, into the center of the city. This is an attractive version of uh, Transmillennial. But let's just say, if you're going at rush hour and you want to go across town, if you were going, to, let's say, the equivalent of from here to Midtown or you know, the village or something, um, it would be, it, I, I've never had an experience like this in my life, and I grew up here. It is, an, it is a harrowing experience, and it would take you about an hour and a half, if you're lucky. So again, this is about uh, a kind of top-down system which, may, which depends upon um, a constant um, vigilance and a political 
consistency, which is not um, part of Colombian culture. There is this very, um, I won't bore you with it, but there are reasons why it turns out that uh, the one mayor will not support what the previous mayor did, and so Transmilenio has effectively been abandoned, and as a result, people in Bogota are now turned entirely against it. Um, so I think this issue of, uh, just to switch back, I think this issue of, the, of public good um, does involve a, a kind of a complex relationship, as you all know, between, um, um, you might say, uh, civic-minded governance and an active people who engage from, as it were, from the bottom up with the government and deciding what kind of places they want to live in, um, what kind of spaces they want to create, what kind of buildings they want to have. Um, uh, obviously, um, what has put this whole issue, and I think for a lot of maybe the young people you're talking about who are now coming up uh, through the school and elsewhere, who are talking more about uh, urbanism, um, one of the reasons I think uh, that this is out there is of course because of what we saw um, down with the Occupy movement uh, down at Zuccotti. Um, Zuccotti was a great, um, as a kind of urban model in public space, it was a gift uh, to me, just taking over the job I, I, just a couple of weeks earlier, providing this occasion to kind of redefine the critic's role and, um, and the architectural conversation within the paper. Uh, and I think just as with 9-11, the gatherings in Union Square, you know, what, what happened to Zuccotti was, and really around the world, was about the power of, of place. It was a celebration in a certain sense of the power of architecture and urbanism. Um, because no matter how instrumental new media uh, have become in spreading protests these days, clearly nothing uh, replaces people physically taking to the streets. I think we do underestimate the political power of physical places and then Tahrir Square comes along. You know, historical upheaval is often linked to place. Kent State, Tiananmen Square, the Berlin Wall, these places haunt our imaginations. I don't know how many of you went and saw it or, or slept there, um, but much as it looked like a, a refugee camp, um, Zuccotti for a while really, I think, became this little miniature polis, a little city in the making. I don't want to overestimate it, but it did have this real DIY, this do-it-yourself democracy that mic check system, you know, because they couldn't amplify, uh, use amplification. They had to say, anybody who wanted to make an announcement had to say it, and then people around had to repeat it and repeat it farther. And incredibly pretentious though it sounds, I, I, this really did put me in my, some, my early classic studies. So there was that, remember that thing about Aristotle saying that a, a, a healthy, uh, the limits of a decent community, I guess how he put it, it only extends as far as the sound of a herald's cry. I, I, I like that. Um, and I, I think Zuccotti happened to be one of those private loan public spaces um, that also raised this issue uh, for people of what is public and what is not. It was, of course, a delicious irony of the Occupy uh, story that you know what used to be called Liberty Park, as you know, then renamed after John Zuccotti, um, had this uh, zoning, had been given this zoning variance which required that the park, unlike a public, a city-owned one, remain open day and night. This could never have happened in a city-owned park. So I think that um, situation did highlight for lots of people how far we had allowed, essentially, the ancient civic ideal of public space to drift from the arena of public expression and public assembly, Speaker's Corner or Hyde Park, let's say, um, to a commercial SOP, uh, the foyer of the Time Warner building. Um, or the windswept you know, corner of 53rd Street and Lex, whatever. So, you know, living in Europe, I often came across these camp encampments in, in Barcelona or Madrid or Athens, uh, uh, lots of different places where these 10 communities were just more or less allowed to exist. Um, public protest and assembly were, I think, part of that same social compact I, I mentioned. And in a way, the, for that reason, they caused less fuss there. Politically speaking, it was, of course, the reaction against Zuccotti that gave it such um, currency. I think the message of the occupiers, you no, know, until the whole thing came, came apart, of course, was fuzzy to a lot of people, but for me, it seemed to be a kind of attempted enactment of a fairer society, creating this um, version of a community that was envisioned to be able to come out of a concern for the greater public good. 
Um, so the park was an essentially common ground for people of, literally common ground for people of shared grievances. And that they came together urbanistically um, with this cumbersome but sort of aspirational form of leadership and with this outlines of a city. You know, as some of you may have seen, there, were, there was a kitchen, um, there, was a, there was a library, uh, there was a legal desk, there was a sanitation department. Um, uh, there was an area where the General Assembly met, there was a medical station, a um, place where people could charge their laptops, even a general store which handed out, like, like, the, like the kitchen, free, um, free things. So in that case, bedding, uh, clothing, toothpaste, deodorant, crucial things. Um, uh, th and I think that this was repeated in a few other places. I just want to say a few last things about the Occupy movement before I get off it. Um, I, did, I do think it revealed certain things about how our cities work, of course, and, and uh, the limits of, of public space. I think it revealed that the great NIMBY in the world, uh, in our world, um, is a space for public protests. I think actually people don't really want them. Um, people want, you know, quiet. Uh, the park's clear, the street's clear and quiet. Um, I think, though, that it caused us to ask, therefore, what is the cost to the public good, public discourse and civic freedom, if the only way to spread one's message is to buy space? Occupy uh, Wall Street, I think, in part unintentionally, raised this question and others, like, what are the spaces in which we do act as a community? Uh, who governs them? Um, who decides on their design and their use? And should we blur the controls, the boundaries, the authority, the thresholds between public and private space, between streets and sidewalks? I mean, I, I think we need ambiguous spaces, multi-use spaces, sloppy spaces, but how do, how do we create them? The pedestrian streets and bike lanes often blur um, the lines uh, between cars and pedestrians, uh, the ambiguity of, of Union Square, um, you know, with these blurred spaces on the north, south, and, uh, and um, west for lots of different things happening. This is a little bit of a blurred space. Um, access to space breeds, I think, a feeling of ownership and ownership of empowerment. But more than access, openness and, um, and, and what, as I said earlier, and I think other people have used this word too, uh, what you might call sloppiness, is key to public space. From a design perspective, this means intentionally incomplete, um, at least partly unplanned spaces that are completed in different ways by different users. So the steps of TKTS, for instance, in Times Square, I think work very well because they provide a platform without a program. The bollards uh, that block the sidewalks in the square and cause oh, so much pedestrian uh, bottlenecking, they, these are not great. The High Line is obviously not an entirely free and open space, and it's certainly not sloppy, the reverse, but it is designed with openness in mind. That is, not as a collection of specific programmatic spaces, but as an interconnected landscape where various and serendipitous things can happen. So the place itself and the views from it are the reason people go there as opposed to going, say, to um, a concert hall or, or a museum for some event or attraction. I wrote today, oddly, about a, a, a ballpark in, in Miami. Um, and of course there, there is the sense of going for an attraction, an event. But it is also, uh, you know, it's another issue, but stadiums are almost the only public spaces many cities actually pay for and design these days. And they are designed to be multi-use places in the event. Um, people, many people now go and don't even watch the game. They go for other reasons. Um, but of course the Occupy Wall Streeters did not select the High Line or Yankee Stadium or Times Square. They went to Zuccotti because all places are also symbolic. And Zuccotti was up the street from, from Wall Street and it was relatively compact. This is interesting. Occupiers across the country and abroad tended towards places like Zuccotti, places that could look jammed and bustling with just a few hundred people, as opposed to, say, um, the Great Lawn, where uh, the same size protest would have looked insignificant. Remember Romney giving a speech in 65,000 seat uh, Ford Theater, you know, in Michigan, um, before 1,200 people. The, the 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 power, the power of space to shape opinion, 
and to, of design, essentially to market a certain message or to subvert it, I guess you'd say. Um, I suspect, in fact, I know what many politicians and private developers have taken from uh, the Occupy movement is that they need to really work much harder to design spaces that cannot be occupied. Um, and you know, the city is now passing all sorts of legislation to change uh, the rules in places like Zuccotti to prevent people from doing anything like this. We, this is something we should all be aware of. The, the laws are being changed as we speak. Um, Jeffrey Howes pointed out that there are two kinds of public spaces, institutionalized spaces and insurgent spaces. Institutional ones, so Yankee Stadium, a Starbucks, insurgent spaces, community gardens, uh, parking lots, um, and Zuccotti. Um, and public space for, for it to be truly public needs to be enacted, that is occupied and used. It is this act of using it that makes it public, that makes it a real place. At the same time, of course, any place can be occupied, including a bridge, if protesters really want it. And of course, you know that, again, to go back to Europe, there have, of course, been many places that are designed to have a certain ambiguity. Barcelona, after the Olympics, designed places where people, these neighborhood spots, these squares and plazas, which can be used for Tai Chi classes or for protests. American cities could use a lot more of these. Um, and of course, when we leave Manhattan, go to the rest of New York, you see that New York could use a lot of these too. Very, very few places, sidewalks aside, where people can come together. Um, so healthy cities uh, need a robust diversity of public spaces. They need destination places like Central Park, but these don't touch most people the way neighborhood squares do. Um, and I'm reminded, I was reminded by that grid show not so long ago of the way in which the city had not really been designed for such places. We have eked them out of the, the kind of monotony of the grid in order to give ourselves what you might call um, more public space and more public health. I want to end with a project uh, which I wrote about for my first article a few months ago um, that many of you may know. It's called Via Verde, um, this housing project in the South Bronx, just opening now. I actually went to the um, ribbon cutting ceremony about two weeks ago. Um, the designers of that, Datner and uh, Grimshaw, began the project, I think, the right way. Um, by asking people in the neighborhood what kind of building they wanted, that they wanted, yeah? And the answer was that people in the South Bronx said they wanted uh, a healthy place to live. Asthma rates are, are very high in the South Bronx, obesity is very commonplace, and access to fruit and vegetables is very limited because you know supermarkets are um, always uh, scarce in poor neighborhoods and Korean groceries are dwindling. I, I gather for the reason that many of the people who opened them wanted to put their kids through college and now all the kids have graduated from Harvard and now the grocers are going out of business. Um, so what can a housing project on its own do uh, about this? I, I think they, um, the developers, Jonathan Rose, and uh, was one of the developers and as well as the architects came up with some simple answers and these are also very good. They, they put a medical clinic um, on the ground floor to occupy the retail space there. The footprint of the building was made narrow. It's a very odd site, a kind of triangular site, difficult site. Um, but that was the, the footprints were made narrow to allow the apartments to wrap around the central courtyard, which is the gathering place, very green place, and also to create uh, two outside exposures uh, for cross ventilation in apartments, along with ceiling fans. So this discouraged air conditioning and created more healthy circulation. And they were masked to peak. Um, on the north-south axis to take maximum advantage of the light. Um, that's, that's a rental tower and these are condos. And these are also co uh, rentals but of different incomes. So it's a mixed income. For the rental units there are 110 of them. I think there were seven or 9,000 applicants, um, which is quite typical. Uh, they're very, very nice apartments actually. I mean, a lot nicer than money of the market rate apartments that are designed as you, as you may know. Staircases were placed before elevators to encourage walking, really kind of simple things. The fitness center the, um, was put on this roof, this green roof. The roof is not only green, but it has these community garden plots, um, which uh, let tenants grow their own fruit and vegetables. Of course, these are very small things, but the, the, it was designed essentially to encourage people to use the health clinic, so the, the, the athletic facilities, so it's not in the basement. 
um, to gather around, uh, to get these gathering places around green sites. Um, they were planted already when I was there the other day with arugula and cilantro. I don't know how many people want cilantro there, but anyway, red lettuce and so forth. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say, just to get back to this issue of public good and, um, and architectural value, um, I, I chose Via Verde too because I, the, the building put a premium on its looks. In other words, it wanted to look like a real signature building. And this seemed to me to reframe, in a certain sense, the question of architectural quality, at least from a journalistic perspective. Because this, to me, was, um, it was perhaps the most crucial part of Via Verde. You know, you have thousands of homeless families and others who are waiting for decent um, subsidized apartments, homes in the city. Um, and you, you have now a point at which higher costs for green construction are, is more or less accepted as uh, an investment in long-term savings. But spending something extra, something extra on something in, as intangible as elegance or architectural distinction, in Villa Guiverde's case, maybe let's say 5% more went into the roof um, and the facade with these big, big windows and these sunshades and balconies and so forth. So that 5% could have gone to create more units of housing. What is the value of architectural distinction? How? morally speaking, can it be weighed against, say, the need for more homes? I mean, architecture alone obviously is not going to solve unemployment or poverty, and neighborhoods rise and fall uh, as decent places to live on the quality of the background buildings, which do and, and should predominate. But I think neighborhoods are also distinguished by their landmarks, by the buildings and places that people come to love, by great works of architecture, or at least very good ones. These places allow less privileged communities to share in the pride and exceptionalism of rich communities which display their wealth, among other ways, by a distinguished architecture. Pride contributes to maintenance and welfare. So I think the greenest and, and most economical architecture always turns out to be the architecture that is preserved because it's cherished. In the end, I, this, this returns us to the question of quality and, and I think brings the architectural conversation um, to the issue of public good. And um, I just think that's where our conversations should always begin and end. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. I've lost, I've lost track of time and I'll stop, but I was, I was told if, if, you, if you have questions or, or something, I'm, I'm happy to talk about whatever. Not so much about Arsenal, but other things. But if you don't, I, I don't want to, I know you have a whole program of events, so. Who has questions? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about the economic revival of penetration back in the 60s? It might, it might have been viable, uh, knowing the fact that uh, it's, it's a heritage that we've lost and always kind of regretted. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because when I wrote, I wrote about Penn Station, partly as a provocation, I thought this was a good example of something that's just out there that matters to millions of people and, and yet we, we for, because of the impossibility, the seeming impossibility of getting anything done there, we, we've allowed ourselves to just write it off. Um, and afterwards, I, I heard from a lot of people who, I, I, so I proposed a plan, yeah, which was just to, because Cuomo had, had proposed moving Javits, I thought there's a site that actually makes some sense. I think it actually does make sense, at least as a, a thought exercise to see what happens if you move Madison Square Garden. But I think there are other less radical solutions which are possible to um, find a way to bring light and air into Penn Station and also to, even to, with the garden still there. Um, the, you know, we all know the problem with Penn Station, which is that um, it's, not, it's not just that the garden is on top of it, it's that you have um, the intersection of so many different uh, interests at this one particular site. You have Fornado, the developer, you have uh, the Dolans and the garden, you have New Jersey Transit, uh, Amtrak, uh, all these different interests. And so it's a perfect illustration of the way our uh, decision-making process is often um, so uh, sclerotic and, uh, and, and thwarted, even when people's interests might overlap. Um, I don't mean to inflate myself in any way in this, but one small thought that occurred to me as I was talking to people, including Vishan, by the way, was that 
the, a, a newspaper like mine might be one of the few places where there's a kind of common ground, where the different interests actually meet and, and uh, at least read something. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's part of the problem, too, that the, the different interests don't, don't quite meet. But as far as, you know, the, the plan, if you meant by commercial, there was that plan, you know, that, uh, and actually Vishan was involved with that, to put the mall essentially on top, Foster to design a mall on top of Madison Square Garden, which we removed and moved to the back of the Farley Post Office, close to Ninth Avenue. This, this fell apart. In the end, I think uh, it didn't need to. It, it could have worked. I think the mall wasn't the greatest idea, but, but the garden was on board. That, that was a pity that that fell apart two years ago, and I don't think people realized um, how close we were to having some solution. Yeah. A very, very interesting phenomena of, of public good in architecture, and that has to do with the expansion of universities as patrons of architecture. Yeah. And uh, uh, this university has a very large program of expansion, sure. and, and, but the one that perhaps concerns you more, yeah. since you grew up in the village, yeah. is NYU. Yeah. And it's a, it's a very curious uh, situation where there is no... Uh, uh, opposition be between, let's say, the developer and the city, but in this mm. case, the university itself seems to be its own worst enemy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the tradition of NYU, with the beautiful campus it started in the, in the, in the Bronx, mm -hmm. uh, hiring McKinney and White to do the most extraordinary library, and then hiring yeah. Marcel Breuer to do next to it an extraordinary sure. building, yeah. and then giving that up, <laughs> and then and, and, it, and then now yeah. threatening the yeah. most beautiful uh, modernist uh, housing block designed by Paul Lester Wiener yeah. with a monster from yeah. within. Yeah. I mean, I, this is something I'd like you to address and because here this is a, a very important topic. Yeah. Well, I, I did write about that, as, as some of you may know, and um, I did for a couple of reasons. And one is because it is my neighborhood and because I had to take my aunt to the uh, protest meetings in Judson Church. Um, <laughs> So, and my whole family was, you know, needless to say, up in arms about this. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I, I, look, I, I agree with you uh, about your assessment of the idea of putting, you know, what we're talking about is Washington Square Village, for those of you who are aware of this. So, that, there were, just to remind you of this history, because I didn't write about this so clearly, you know, when Moses wanted to put the buses through Washington Square Park, he also arranged to broaden both um, Mercer Street and LaGuardia then called West Broadway. Um, so those green strips that are along West Broadway were, they're, they're Department of Transportation. They're actually not owned by NYU. They're, they're DOT property because they were where the, the street would have widened. And then all those, these three super blocks were destroyed, all the housing there. My aunt remembers the famous landlord, the beneficent landlord who used to rent, you know, tenement housing in the block where, um, I think it's where Bobst is now. Um, you know, to artists and writers and so forth. I mean, I, of course, Moses saw it as just, you know, crappy housing which had to be eliminated, but it's part of the community. So those were, those were torn down, and then the Washington Square Village was erected, not called that at first, with the idea that a third super block uh, would be created. Then the developer backed out of that, so NYU took it over, hired pay, and so you had these two very different super blocks, one with the Washington Square Village, Wiener's thing, and then you have Pay's Silver Towers on the southern one. Um, you know, I see it as an interesting case in which you, you have a community that, is, that has been traumatized um, by a lot of what NYU has done, but is also in many ways intransigent. Um, uh, the village has changed a lot. It's, it's, it's in, village, the village is like every place else. It, if it's to stay alive, it needs to change. I'm not a believer in preserving this intact, but you know, it likes to pretend that it's still what it was in 1954 or whenever it was, 62, or I don't know, and, and it's not. It's a, it's a it's obscenely expensive neighborhood that isn't anything like what it was. And so this issue of preservation, I'm not entirely sympathetic with. At the same time, NYU you know, has not been honest about, um, about what it, um, what its intentions are and, and have been. So the idea of installing these two monstrous sort of 
boomerang-shaped things in the middle of Washington Square Village strikes me as being almost, a, um, I mean, if they're really serious about it, which I, I find hard to believe, either an incredible affront to the neighborhood and also an abdication, by the way, I should say, because Moses seized these blocks with eminent, uh, by, by eminent domain. So there was an, a, an obligation. There is inherent in this architecture, I think, um, an idea of public good being served. And those spaces with that you know, raised garden in there in, in the Washington Square Village between the two buildings, uh, this should be public space. It should be open and accessible. And NYU, should, NYU has gone out of its way to allow it to become, as it were, decrepit and inaccessible. And now says, well, when we put these buildings in, we'll landscape it, and then it's going to look much nicer. This is a lie. That said, the other block, though, they built this horrible, forgive me if many of you love this, but I think it's a horrible gym. You know, there at the corner, this sort of fortress building. And so I'm not, personally, I don't see a problem with installing something there. I think it's a mixed thing. But obviously, there is no middle ground in these conversations. Uh, and that's really, I think, the big problem, that we don't, we, we've gotten out of a process whereby we, we set up this situation. I, it's interesting to come back to this uh, in New York and see it so clearly. We set up a situation where um, both sides essentially have to, for political reasons, take these real extremes. I suppose it's true in our political arena as well. Um, and so this a, a kind of constructive middle conversation doesn't take place publicly. We don't really arrive at a, a place publicly. We, we arrive at something that's either a compromise that neither side really wanted or with a loser. But we don't, I'm not being very clear, but it's, it's quite striking to me. I, for instance, uh, remain nameless, but let's just say one, uh, people on both sides of that, whom I spoke to privately, were willing to say things to me when I finally said, well, what do you actually want? What do you actually expect? That they have never said and would never say to anybody publicly. I'm thinking, well, that's, that can't be a way towards progress. So I think it, NYU is an extremely interesting case for lots of reasons that have to do with historic preservation and the uh, intransigence of you know, both sides and so forth. I really hope, uh, but I'm a little worried uh, what Amanda's going to do, because I thought she was very skeptical about the plan. But of course, then Bloomberg came out and said that he thought that NYU should be allowed to do everything it wants. And so, I, you know, I don't, I mean, she works for him ultimately. So that would, that would be really unfortunate. I don't think NYU would actually build it because they don't have the money. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to, do I, think, I don't think they're going to have an Alston problem. I think they're going to spend 10 years trying to raise the money to do one building and then Sexton will retire. And who knows what will happen. But if they get approval to do it, there will always be the threat that that, that that can happen. I think we should, I'm sorry to speechify, but I just want to finish this one thing. The thing that I wrote was intended also to say, we, we should be, you know, we should be thinking more about how we can design, everything in the city is based on what we can get from developers in return for the public. But if we began to think about, it seems crazy here, but it isn't in fact a crazy thought, what kind of neighborhoods do we want? What kinds of things do we want for the neighborhoods and the public? And in return, you know, what, what then will we make developers do? So in this case, we should say, we want to get back that Washington Square Village space. Turn that into a genuinely public space. That would piss off many of the NYU faculty who are opposed to the expansion because they actually don't want their own building opened up that much, but it would be for the greater public good. Demand that. In return for that, NYU, then you can maybe get something. That, that's a kind of flipping around. That was my logic. I, I think it's a civilized way to think about things, but yeah. I just wanted to ask a question about Lower Manhattan, where I now have had my office for the last five years. About where, I'm sorry? Lower Manhattan, yeah. uh, which is an absolutely amazing collection of public spaces from a sort of historical framework and what's been done in the last 20 years. And while you still have the waterfront being developed, redeveloped, reinvented as a completely open and public space, the effect of Occupy Wall Street, as, as one who's down there, uh, is only one piece of a puzzle of all manner of occupation of public space mm. from the uh, 
wonderful pedestrian zone around the uh, stock exchange mm -hmm. enforced by federal employees with uh, automatic, automatic weapons mm -hmm. and cameras all over the place mm -hmm. uh, to the World Trade Center public spaces which hold this promise of being this new open public plaza but I think is in doubt whether they will in fact ever be open to access to the public and then the response uh, of the older plazas, pre-later regulations plazas like Chase, which was clearly an Occupy target, yeah. which has fenced off its entire yeah. property and closed off Cedar Street right. uh, because they don't want to be in the position of pushing people off, uh, that we are in fact in a very interesting dynamic in which the effect of Occupy is just one other aspect of uh, both open but highly supervised, yeah. highly uh, scrutinized, camera uh, yeah. observed public spaces in lower Manhattan. Yeah. And I just, uh, I'm still wrestling with what this all means, but I would just be curious as your No, of uh, course, this uh, is absolutely true. Impressions. And, yeah, no, it's absolutely right. I mean, the, the issue of being monitors is, of course, a complex one and, uh, and is not at all unrelated to this, but what, what is our public, uh, how, how, what kind of privacy can we expect in a public place? is one very large issue. But I think um, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is inevitable that if, if a subject is suddenly presented publicly um, and is out there, that there will be a reaction. So, I mean, what I meant is true, that the reaction, the official reaction to Occupy is to rewrite the laws by which we can use public space. I mean, the, the number, the amount, the FAR stuff that has, that has turned into gigantic buildings, the amount that has been given up essentially by the public to get these uh, you know, public pops is just incredible. And uh, they are often closed. They are often closed off and they're going to increasingly be. It's a question now of real vigilance and I think Lower Manhattan is, is a great place to talk about this because I couldn't agree more that the area around the World Trade Center is going to be much less of a public space than was claimed. I mean, it's an interesting problem there, right? Because potentially you have um, the redevelopment or, or reorientation, let's say, of Battery Park City, which has always turned its ass to the rest of the city. It's possible maybe to find a way to reconnect across West Street. And then you could have the area around uh, the, tra the former trade World Trade Center. Well, now the World Trade Center. Um, and then all the way, as you say, to the river with a new development along the river, you could have this really interesting new network of public spaces. But each of them is very tenuous, and it's not clear that any of them are actually being, uh, are going to end up being truly public spaces. I'm particularly worried, as you are too, obviously, by the World Trade uh, Center, because so much of it now, you know, it, the idea I think of restoring the city grid was great, but now cars won't be allowed on this, and there's going to obviously be limitations to traffic. I, I think it's a, you, you raise a very good subject. I don't have an answer to it. But I do think that, that one of the virtues of, of the Occupy thing was to move this from some obscure corner of the architectural conversation into the central uh, part of the public conversation about, you know, the relationship of, the public to the city. I, I mean, I hope that the conversation therefore doesn't die, die with the Occupy movement. I think it's obvious why uh, it, it, this was an inspired choice of speaker and I would thank Michael Raymond. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks. What I don't know is since the Alumni Association is in charge whether or not we're having a break. 10 minute break for caffeine, uh, and then we come back to the first panel to be shared by the Shine Jack of Is the Shine here? No. Probably the American say hello to him. I hope that was okay. It's great. Okay. Super good. So you made the trip to Columbia? I did, yeah. I have to write about it now. That's the much harder, <laughs> that's the much harder part. It was interesting. It's an easy part. Really interesting, though, to see how some of you go to see as a great success turns into yeah. a great calamity. Yeah. Just like that. So. Yeah, we did it.